from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the following is provided by the West Virginia Department of Education and West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Hey! Hey everyone, it's Education Station! Hi, and welcome back to Education Station. I'm your host, Alex Milanese. Education Station is a show where we invite teachers from all across West Virginia to submit videos of themselves teaching their favorite lessons. In today's episode, we're getting three exciting lessons about math, poetry, and personal responsibility. So we're kicking things off today with Ms. Sinisi, who has a great lesson about least common denominators. Let's check it out. Today we're going to do the second math lesson and it's on least common denominators. So last time we talked about adding fractions and now we're going to talk about trying to add fractions with different denominators and how we do that. So first of all, let's look at what is the least common denominator. It's the smallest of all of the common denominators. So that's the one that we're looking for, the one we have to find. Why do we want to find the least common denominator? Um, because we can't add fractions with different denominators. They have to have the same denominator, so therefore we have to find the least common denominator. If we're looking at our pizzas in this instance, we have one third of a pizza here, and we want to add one sixth of this pizza here, and we'll see what our answer would be. So, and this we can't add because we have a three here and we have a six here. So let's find the least common denominator. Um, what should it be? Um, one easy way we could do is just to multiply these two denominators together, right? So if we multiply three times six, we get 18. And then we're going to use 18 here on our pizzas. So instead of having three or six slices, both of our pizzas in this instance now have 18 slices. So here are all of these slices. So we can change this to 6 18ths on this pizza, and there are 3 18ths on this pizza. Now since we have 18 here and 18 here, and that's a common denominator, we can add the numerators. So 6 plus 3 equals 9, and then we just bring the 18 over. So in this instance, our pizza has 9 eighteenths. But it, they do have common denominators, but isn't the least common denominator they could have. And that's what we're looking for, the lowest number, right? So can we do the same problem with fewer slices? Yes, we can, and here's how we're going to do it. We take our one-third and the, and, the, and the denominator on the bottom, and we want to list the multiples of that denominator. Multiples are just like your multiplication tables. So we say three, that's three times one, right? Six is three times two. So three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18, 21, and so on. Then we have to list the common multiples, or the multiples of six. So here we have six, 12, 18, 24, 30. So we compare these two lists of numbers to look for the lowest number they have in common. So that says, what is the smallest number that both of them have that are the same? So we can look right here, and it's a six. So therefore, six is our least common denominator. Now, can we do this problem with just six slices? Yes, we can. But we want to multiply both of our fractions so that they only have that six slices because six is our least common denominator. So when we multiply the top and the bottom of one third by two, we get one times two is two, three times two is six. Now both of our denominators are six and that's the lowest common denominator. So let's look at our, our problem that we started with. Now we've changed this to two sixths, one third, we still have one sixth here, so if we take our two sixths of a pizza here and add it to our one sixth of a pizza here, we get three sixths. The last step we have to do is to simplify our fraction. Three sixths can be reduced to one half. Now we have the correct answer for that problem with using the least common denominator. Let's look at this example. What is one sixth plus seven fifteenths. The denominator here is six and the denominator here is 15. So let's search for the least common denominator the same way we did the others, by listing the multiples. So we have to list the multiples of six. 
So we're going to start again, just like your multiplication tables, 6, 12, 18, 24, 30, 36, and so on. Then we're going to list the multiples of 15. 15, 30, 45, 60. Then we're going to compare these two number lines. And so the least common multiple of both 6 and 15 is 30. We can circle it right there. Now we have 30. That's our least common denominator. So what we do to the bottom of the fraction, we have to do to the top of the fraction because that matches them up. So here's our 30 on the bottom and our 30 on the bottom. So if we take 6 and we say, what can we multiply 6 by to get 30? And that's 5. So we multiply 6 times 5 to get 30. And if we multiply it on the bottom times 5, we have to multiply on the top times 5. So 1 times 5 is 5. So that tells us what we're doing here. We did that for our first fraction. We have to do it for our second fraction. So here's our 7 fifteenths. So we look at 15 and we say, what do we multiply 15 by to get 30? That is 2, right? So if we multiply 15 by 2 to get 30 on the bottom, we have to multiply 7 by 2, and that is equal to 14 on the top. Now we can do the addition. So we have to add the top numbers. We have the same denominator, which is what we wanted, and we bring it over, and we have 5 plus 14, that equals 19. So our answer is 19 thirtieths. This fraction is already in the simplest form. We cannot reduce this fraction, so that would be our final answer without being able to reduce it. So let's just do a little practice here at the end. So we want to add 3 eighths plus 5 twelfths, right? What is the first thing that we do again? We have to list the multiples. So the first multiple we'll list is 8. The multiples of 8, the multiplication tables, are 8, 16, 24, 32, 40, on and on and on. Then we have to list the multiples of the second fraction's denominator, which would be multiples of 12, 12, 24, 36, 48. Now what is our least common multiple? I've put it here for you. We search and we have 24. 24 is the lowest number in both of our sets that matches, right? So for the first fraction, we can multiply the top and the bottom by 3. So we look at 8, we say what times 8 equals 24? That's 3. So I told you before, if you do it to the bottom number, you have to do the same thing to the top number. So 3 times 3 is 9. So 9 24 is our first number. For the second fraction, we can multiply the top and the bottom by 2. What times 12 equals 24? That's 2. If you did it to the bottom, you have to do it to the top. So 5 times 2 is 10. 10 24 would be our second fraction. Now, since we have like denominators, we can add those fractions. So we add our 9 24 to our 10 24 and we get 19 24 This is already in its simplest form. We cannot reduce this fraction any farther. So that way, that would be our final answer. So I wanted you to get from this whole entire lesson that if we're adding fractions, they have to have the same denominator. If they do not, you have to find the least common denominator, make both of the fractions match, and then you can add the top numbers with that least common denominator to get the correct answer. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Ms. Sinisi. You know, when we think about math like we did in our last segment, it helps us develop our problem-solving skills. But it's just as important to develop our creativity. So in our next segment, Miss Dawson is going to share a fun and creative poetry lesson. Let's check it out. Hi, my name is Andy, and today we're going to be reading a few poems from a poet named Shel Silverstein. Here's his picture right here. You can see him there with his guitar. And then I'm going to go ahead and tell you a little bit about him. So. Shel Silverstein is the author of The Giving Tree and many other poems. He also wrote songs, drew cartoons, sang, played the guitar, and loved to have a good time. So I'm going to read three poems today, and the first poem is going to be from this book called Where the Sidewalk Ends. All right, this poem is illustrated and written by Shel Silverstein. And the poem is called Love. So this poem is about 
this little boy right here. And you can see him there standing all alone with the letter V. All right, so we're gonna figure out why he's all by himself. Um, okay, so love. Ricky was our L, but he's home with the flu. Lizzie, our O, had some homework to do. Mitchell, E, probably got lost on the way. So I'm all of love that can make it today. Okay, next um, we're gonna go ahead and do the activity to go with our first poem. So we see our little boy here all alone and we're gonna go ahead and find the rest of the letters to comp complete the word love so that he's not all by himself. So our activity is gonna be a scavenger hunt. Uh, for the scavenger hunt, you're gonna have to make your own letters. So here are mine, you can see I just wrote the letter on, the, on a page, so you want to have uh, one letter per page, and then you can decorate it however you want. So this one's L, here's my O, my V, and my E. My E. Okay, so what we're going to do um, is go ahead and write them on the pages, and then decorate them however you want and then you're gonna have somebody else hide them for you all around your house. And then you can go and look for the letters, and when you find the letters, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and put them in order. So we have our, again, we have our L, O, V, and our E. And that'll spell love. All right, that's all for our first poem and the poem that goes with our first activity. Our next poem is going to be from the book Falling Up. This book's also written and illustrated by Shel Silverstein. So this poem is about a monster and it's called Hi Monster. Here you can see the monster's long tail. All right, Hi Monster. What's that coming through the mist? The Hi Monster, he's running free. And if his tail is as long as this, just think how big the high monster must be. You can see how big his tail is here. It stretches two whole pages. You see it? It has scales on it. All right. So that's all for our second poem. Okay. So the activity for our second poem is going to be, um, what we're going to do is I want you guys to draw a picture of what you think the high monster is going to look like based off of his tail. So let me find the poem again. Hold on a second. I lost my bookmark. Here it is. Okay, so here's the monster's tail. You can see there with its scales, it's real long. And we know the monster is supposed to be big. So you guys can draw a picture, whatever you think that it's gonna look like. Here's mine. So my monster is fluffy and he has a scary face and mouth and a funky nose and big bushy eyebrows and small wiggly arms and some legs to match his arms. And then there's his tail. And you can see he has the scaly long tail. All right, what do you guys think the monster's gonna look like? Go ahead and draw whatever you think it'll look like. You can, can be anything you want. All right, that's all for our, uh, for our second activity. Okay. So our third poem is from a book called A Light in the Attic. And this book is also written and illustrated by Shel Silverstein. So the poem is about a rock and roll band. And you can see the rock and roll band down here below. They're playing all their instruments. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Rock and roll band. If we were a rock and roll band, we'd travel all over the land. We'd play and we'd sing and we'd wear spangly things if we were a rock and roll band. If we were a rock and roll band and we were up there on the stand, the people would hear us and love us and cheer us. Hooray for that rock and roll band. If we were a rock and roll band, then we'd have a million fans. We'd giggle and laugh and sign autographs if we were a rock and roll band. If we were a rock and roll band, the people would all kiss our hands. We'd be millionaires and have extra long hair if we were a rock and roll band. But we ain't no rock and roll band. 
We're just seven kids in the stand with homemade guitars and pails and jars and drums of potato chip cans. Just seven kids in the sand talking and waving our hands and dreaming and thinking, oh, wouldn't it be grand if we were a rock and roll band? What do you guys think it would be like to be in a rock and roll band? Here, you can see all the kids playing with their instruments. Okay, for uh, activity for a third poem about the rock and roll band, we're gonna go ahead and make some instruments. That way you guys can have your own rock and roll band at home. So our first instrument is gonna be a guitar. So for this one, all you'll need is a empty box. So I'm using an empty uh, cracker box and then um, you can have an adult cut a hole in the center of the box and you put rubber bands around the box. So again, all you'll need is a box and some rubber bands. So you just stretch the rubber bands around the box and cover the hole. I used three for mine, but you can use as many as you want. And then you strum it and it'll make some noise like a guitar. All right, this will be instrument number two. Um, for this instrument, we're going to make a drum. And all you need for this one is an empty coffee ground can or any empty can. And you can tap on the lid and it'll sound like a drum. Okay, for our third instrument, we're going to put, uh, it's going to be a maraca. So all you'll need is an empty jar and some uh, popcorn kernels, or you could use rice or dry beans. And you'll wanna take the lid off your jar and then pour a little bit of kernels inside. And then you can shake it and it'll sound like a maraca. All right, and for our fourth and final instrument, we have the tambourine. Uh, for the tambourine, you'll need two paper plates, just like these ones. And then you can, um, what you'll do is you can punch, hole punch little holes in the sides and then get some ribbon and then thread the ribbon through the hole and tie it so your plates stay together, just like this. And then you'll tie the first two on and then um, before you tie the last one, you'll wanna pour some rice inside and then close it up. So um, you can also use beans or popcorn kernels for this one. So I'm gonna go ahead and use some rice and then, let's see, you just oh, make a little hole, pull, pull the plates apart a little bit. You wanna pour some rice inside. And then you can tie your final ribbon and make sure it's closed up really good. And then you have your very own tambourine. All right. Um, and there are lots of other instruments you can make with stuff around your house. You just have to use your imagination. Um, all right, that'll be all today for our poems. Thank you guys for joining me and reading our poems. And I hope you have fun with your activities at home. Thanks, Miss Dawson. Okay, our final stop today is with Mr. Harris, who's going to discuss the importance of personal responsibility. Let's check it out. Hi, my name's Jim Harris. I'm the Associate Director of the Autism Training Center at Marshall University. We've collaborated with the West Virginia Department of Education's Office of Special Education and Student Support to create the West Virginia Behavior and Mental Health Technical Assistance Center. We're excited to continue that collaboration as we partner with Public Broadcasting and WVDE to help provide information to families during the challenging time of the COVID-19 pandemic. In this video, I want to talk to you about one of my favorite topics, which is how do we build responsibility into our child's day? Now, 
why is that such an important conversation? And why is building responsibility such an important thing? Because ultimately the goal of parenting isn't just to raise children, but to develop functional adults. And one of the key things in helping us develop the competency of our own children is to slowly through childhood, give them the opportunity to take on developmentally appropriate responsibility and build their competency. So when I start talking about things like chores and things like that, we gotta first start with why are chores important? Why is responsibility important to be an essential part of your child's day? And again, a developmentally appropriate responsibility. Well, if we're thinking that chores are for kids to pay the price or because um, we want them, uh, want to break them down with different tasks and things like that, we're missing the point of the importance of chores. There's two main reasons why responsibility is such a critical part of our child's daily life. When The first one is competency. Now, what do we mean by competency? Competency is the feeling and the satisfaction when you know you've, you're capable of doing something. So, if we look at the main goal of parenting, the main goal of child development, it is to develop into a functional adult. It's to develop into a person who can contribute to society. So if we're looking at that as a key outcome or kind of beginning with the end in mind, then what, we, what our job is in child development is to provide children experiences to build competency, to build ability to deal with things, solve problems, develop skills. So competency comes from being given a responsibility, being given support and how to uphold or, or um, meet that responsibility and then have mastery over that responsibility or task. So when we look at what chores um, represent, it's the opportunity to develop mastery over responsibility. And for kids, that becomes a key part of self-competence or self-esteem, self-concept these things that help them in their future life. The second thing that makes having responsibility a part of a child's daily life so important is the ability to add value to others around you. So what chores offer is the opportunity to add value to the family, to add value to school, to add value to the community. So when we give a child responsibility, what we're saying is you're a part, a meaningful part of this group, this family, this classroom, this community. And too often with kids, we talk about what everybody does for them. And if we allow that to uh, be the primary focus, then that creates a very one-sided psychology for kids, meaning they just expect to be taken care of. They just expect things uh, um, to come to be done for them when what we really want to develop to develop a more uh, balanced person a more psychologically balanced a more um, healthy psychology is a, a young person who not only understands that people do things for them but they do things for others so chores give our kids an opportunity to add value to others in their life now make no mistake about it I'm not telling you that although we just said that uh, chores are so developmentally important, don't expect your kids to be super excited because you're going to give them more responsibility and give them more chores. That being said, I have had a lot of kids and when they get the opportunity to say, for example, learn to mow grass or pick out their own clothes or whatever that developmentally appropriate responsibility or task may be, where they immediately have that interest, they immediately have that sense of self-confidence or that, 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 that rise in their self-esteem. So there will be times when kids getting that added responsibility, getting that added chore or task is going to actually immediately bolster their psychology. Now, but there's also going to be times when you give that responsibility and the kid's not going to be excited. And, and that's just part of child development. Um, you know, there's, I'll think back to my own childhood, you know, when I was mowing grass, I didn't pop out of bed at, at when I was 14 years old and say, hey, dad, I'm excited to go mow grass today and grow personally. No, but I'll tell you one thing. I promise you that when I finished mowing that grass, there were several times when I would look at that yard and feel the satisfaction that I did that. So keep in mind that just because kids aren't immediately seeing the value in the task or chore, um, don't let that discourage you. Understand that you're playing the long game here. The first place to start when thinking about a chore for your child or responsibility to integrate into your child's daily routine is, is this chore or responsibility developmentally appropriate? Taking into consideration my child's age, intellectual ability, physical ability, is this a good chore that fits my child? 
If you need help figuring out what chores might be developmentally appropriate for your child, there's a lot of great resources online and also some really good ideas on social media apps such as Pinterest. Here are a few ideas you might consider for your kids. One of my favorites is having your child help take care of the family pet. This chore is great for a number of reasons, one of which is it teaches your child the experience of having another living thing that counts on them. Another is it scales really well with age for young kids can be a part in a small way and older kids could take almost full responsibility for the care of the family pet. Another great chore is having your child help with their own laundry. This is another one that scales really well by age and developmental ability. Everything from your child just helping carry things down or sorting by color, even to having full responsibility as they get older for the days they do their laundry and having their clothes clean and ready to go for school that week. Dishes are another great chore to consider. I like dishes because they also scale well in developmental ability and age. It can start with very basic things like helping sort silverware, uh, rinsing off dishes, putting certain cabinets away, all the way to being a more advanced chore where the child takes almost full responsibility for the chore of dishes each day. Another great chore is yard work. Now, before we go too much further, yard work, it's important that we keep an eye on safety, especially with younger children and equipment that can be dangerous. But yard work's one of my favorites because one, it gets kids outside, two, it gets kids moving, and three, it also gives kids an opportunity to collaborate and solve problems on projects together with the whole family. I hope you found this video helpful. I want to remind you that it's critical that we find ways to build responsibility in our child's day-to-day -day lives. Most of all, because it helps them develop a sense of competency and mastery and gives them the opportunity to add value in the lives of others. For the most current information regarding the West Virginia Department of Education's response to the COVID-19 crisis, you can go to www.wvde.us slash COVID-19. This site also has resources for families as well as educators. For more information regarding the West Virginia Behavior Mental Health Technical Assistance Center, you can go to www.marshall.edu slash BMHTAC. Thanks, Mr. Harris. All right, well, that wraps up everything for us here today on Education Station. We want to thank everyone who submitted their awesome lessons. And we want to thank you for watching. We'll see you next time right here on Education Station.